Long before the massive explosion that tore into Beirut last August, Lebanon had been following a path that led only one way — to self-destruction. As the smoke rose over the city, around 200 people lay dead and thousands had been injured — victims of corrupt and incompetent politicians who, for generations, had allowed their citizens to sink into poverty and despair. The explosion was a terrible symbol of that neglect. The cause, a highly volatile quantity of ammonium nitrate that had sat for years in a warehouse while port officials warned of the danger it posed, warnings that were systematically ignored. But would anything change in the aftermath? Would anyone ever be held to account? Foreign sympathy arrived in the shape of France's Emmanuel Macron, only he brought an uncompromising message. There's no blank check, he told people. If your political class fails, we won't come to Lebanon's aid. And fail it did. Days later, the government resigned. Not only did the politicians have no answers, they had, like so many before them, simply given up. Who would now fill the vacuum? Hello and welcome to this special edition of Conflict Zone. Over the last four years, we've interviewed several senior Lebanese politicians about the inexorable breakdown of their economy and their state institutions. What they told us provides an unusually clear insight into the reasons for Lebanon's intractable crisis. We sought answers to some key questions. What had gone wrong? Who was to blame for the sinking economy? And how could the country move forward? But instead of answers, we got promises of progress, of clarity and commitment, even transparency, that in most cases came to nothing. In February 2016, I caught up with Gibran Basil, then the country's foreign minister, who acknowledged the central feature of Lebanese politics, endemic corruption, as well as all the other contradictions that have made it impossible for the state to function. Yes, we have corruption in our country, but this is why we need to have strong leaders to fight corruption. Corruption and, and different factions playing politics. Yes. With a nation that can ill afford it. I mean, even the patriarch spoke of the erosion of your state institutions yes. at the moment. Yes, of course. So the, you're collapsing. The, you're, the, the, the state's collapsing. It's, it depends how you, how you define the collapse. We still have at least a family in Lebanon. We still have values values of how we live, how we think towards the other, where, where this is fading completely in other parts. Even in strong and prosperous countries, you don't see this kind of cohesion that we still have in Lebanon. Cohesion? Not, you, you failed know, to you know, get a president in okay. two years. But, what cohesion but, is that? Almost 35 attempts to get a quorum in parliament. You haven't managed to do it. You haven't passed a budget since 2005. You have a parliament whose mandate ran out in 2013 and had to extend it twice without recourse to the public. You haven't had legislative elections since 2009. Yes, and we were against... This is complete paralysis of the political yes. body, isn't it? And we are against all this. But well, I'm, you're not I'm, doing much I'm, about I'm, it, I'm not then, defending, to be against it. I'm not defending the politics in Lebanon, the politicians, nor the... You're one of the them, Minister. I'm you're one of them. I'm defending something that belongs to all of us in humanity. I'm defending the idea and the model that we still represent of diversity, of living together, of accepting each other where we are different. This is what I'm defending. And this is where I'm seeing the importance of Lebanon. If we have this model versus the model of Daesh, what do you choose? You choose the Raqqa model with Daesh, or you still have Lebanon, where people can still live together. Because what else can you get? So you can get the Daesh model. Minister, how much of this living together was apparent when you see the people protest on the streets of Lebanon, as they have done over the last year, and they get uh, subjected to unacceptable violence by the security services. Uh, water cannon, tear gas. 
but you, you know, rubber bullets. You know, I was among the protesters. Unacceptable I went the, I went levels my, of violence. I went myself to the street because I refused the situation. But so who's so in charge in your it is, government? It is, it is who's we, in charge? We are, we are in jail there, in jail of power, because we cannot leave again. You're a government that doesn't control your security services. Is that what you're telling me? No, still, even with the security level, we are still fine if we compare us to other region, uh, other countries around us in the region. So again, it is a situation that we have to fix how? By not imposing a, a solution that is a, a ready solution, a ready recipe. By allowing the Lebanese let let them go to elections and allow them to choose. Well, you their haven't leaders. had elections, we pointed out, we, since 2009. Yes, and we were against this. We, we, and we, I'm, I'm confused because, because your prime minister said the levels of force used against demonstrators was unacceptable. He's the prime minister. Can't he do anything about this? Yes, he stopped it. But well, how did he stop it? It, it, it who, was, who was prosecuted? It, 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 as you know, I'm telling you, who I was, was prosecuted. I was myself on the street. No, but who you was know, prosecuted? I went three times to the for street the excesses. because I refused the situation. Minister, you refused the situation, but people got beaten up, people got hospitalized, dozens of people were taken to hospital, people no, were no, injured let's, on let's, the streets. Let's, let's not portray Lebanon as a country where you you, you don't allow people to express uh, themselves. The, we have an excess of democracy in uh, in Lebanon, and people are allowed to speak out whatever You're they want. Security organizations are this, out of this control. Happened, this, happened, this happened again. Lebanon is the bacon of uh, of freedoms in the region, and this happened once. We don't take this incident and uh, extrapolate it on our Minister, daily life. How can you claim to be a beacon of freedom when the allegations of torture carried out by your security services are widespread? In June last year, there was a leaked video showing members of your internal security forces torturing inmates in Rumia prison north of Beirut. The interior minister confirmed that the video was authentic. This is the kind of beacon of tolerance and coexistence that you say you have, where torture is widespread. No, torture, Human Rights Watch no, said this was just no, the tip of the iceberg. This is an exception that confirms uh, the, the rule. No, we don't have this common. This is an incident that happened there. If you say that this is what happened in Guantanamo, does it mean that in the U.S. you live the torture? This is an incident that happened once and that confirmed that we, this is not the case in Lebanon. You know, you no. know very well, Minister. No, we committee. refute this completely because it is. we have so many things that we are not satisfied about in Lebanon, but we don't turn it into being a place where people are tortured. And yet the reports, credible reports of torture, have continued to surface in the four years since that interview was recorded. No change there. No change either in any of the sectarian carve-ups and political patronage that have acted and still act as immovable roadblocks to reform. Ever since the Civil War, the complex power-sharing system spawned many factions and warlords who empowered and enriched themselves at the expense of the people. They shared between them the spoils, the top jobs, the lucrative contracts. And even as they watched the country disintegrate and default, the last thing they wanted was to give back the money and relinquish their power. In June this year, the combative foreign minister at the time, Nassif Hitti, was still repeating the same vague assurances and the same good intentions that had consistently led nowhere. I hear your intentions. Your public sector has been looted for decades by the same sectarian powers that still dominate well, your country. Well, this is what we're trying. If you, you, see, you, you never now, allow me to finish the phrase, so I'm listening to you now. You yeah, go tell me what we I should do. Finished, Perhaps we can profit from you. I haven't finished the question. You think these warlords and power brokers... Who but you have never letting me finish the answer. You've been giving me a okay. great answer for a couple of minutes. Do you, think, do you think these warlords and power brokers who control so much in Lebanon will just sit around while you shine a light on all their dirty dealings, and then they'll just say sorry and hand back all the billions that they've stolen. You really think that's going to happen? We are not going to think so. Thanks for putting this question. We know it's an uphill struggle. We know it's a key challenge, and we have to stand up to the challenge or fail. I know the difficulties. I fully agree with you about the seriousness of the challenges, about how heavily they are weighing on us since years. But we have to come out with an answer. Otherwise, we will not be taking the road that we promised to take. That's a very important matter. I fully agree about the challenges, the nature of the challenges, the magnitude of the challenges. But we have to come out with an answer to these challenges and create a sort of rupture with the past.
and your, get on a start on a new uh, foot. Your your country's record doesn't inspire confidence, does it? Since the civil war, Lebanon has promised four times to reform in return for four. It seems, eight, sir, you enjoy speaking about the past. Packages. I'm telling you about the future. If you want to go into the past, we can have a lesson in history now. Yeah, but why should anyone? I'm trying believe to tell you. We know the stories. We learned the lessons. We're trying. And we're telling the international community, look, us, look at us and let's see if we succeed. We are, we, are, we are planning to succeed. We're committed to success because we have to save our country. Again, I agree with you about your description of the situation, which I already know, we all, we all know. And again, I'm saying it's a major challenge. Let's see for you if you can succeed in facing up to it. And this is the challenge that you are taking on us, is to succeed this matter with the cooperation. It's our prime responsibility as Lebanese government. It's a, not an easy matter. I fully agree with you. It's a very difficult matter because of this well-established, well-entrenched system that you rightly described and with which I fully agree with you. But this is the only road that you have to take to create a rupture with the past. The challenges are very important, very deep, but we have to take this is the only available road to get out of this messy situation. But two months later, Mr. Hitty took his own road and resigned, contradicting all the firm assurances he'd given in the interview and declaring that the government he'd so briefly served had shown a lack of will to reform. Of course it had. To many Lebanese, the system had long since passed the point where it could be effectively reformed. It now needed to be replaced from top to bottom. But how to convince the power brokers of that? Even the slow motion collapse of the state, signposted so often and in so many ways, still wasn't enough to persuade them that the old game was finally ending. Your prime minister warned last year that Lebanon risked becoming a failing state. Even the most basic services now don't get provided to your people. How did you let it get so bad? I wouldn't call Lebanon a failed state when he was able to cope with 50% of his population as refugees, 200 Syrian displaced to Lebanon per square kilometer. I where, warn where, that he said he, last October, he, I warn we are moving towards yeah. collapse if matters continue. Yeah, but when, when solid states and successful states like in Europe were not able to receive more than 10,000 refugees and Lebanon got adapted with one and a half million, I wouldn't, uh, we have a very successful model that if it fails, our model of diversity and uh, coexistence, then everything will fail. And Minister, it's not world. successful when you can't even cope with the rubbish on the streets. You can't even clear the rubbish. You can't blame the refugees for that, can you? No, but this is, uh, this is our responsibility. I cannot deny it, but still... This is a system uh, that has become, the, the activists say, so inefficient yeah. and corrupt that it can't provide basic services. Yeah, it depends how you, how you measure the success of a society. You can have a, a democracy and a prosperity, but no cohesion in a society. So everything gets disintegrated. At but a society least, that can't clear the rubbish and can't clear the air for its people and puts their health in danger shouldn't be governing, should yeah, it? I, I, I'm not defending this, but I'm, I'm saying you have also political garbage and you have the war garbage that we are witnessing everywhere. And I think this is still less costly than having dealing people as garbage and killing them. Like when we have 200,000 uh, killed per people in, uh, in uh, Syria and in the region, we are enforcing a change. I understand, but a government that cannot provide basic services isn't worthy of the name of a government, is it? Why don't you all resign because and find, find somebody who can clear the rubbish? Ah, you, are, you are right on this, but uh, the problem is that we have vacancy. In but our you don't president. resign. You stay there. We cannot resign. We are obliged to stay because there will be no government, there will be complete void in, uh, in Lebanon if we resign. Stay and gamble with the health of your people. No, no, we're, uh, we should elect a president who should be representative of his people, a strong president with strong popularity, and then we will have another government. Instead, there are feuds, infighting, manipulation, and you say this is a model of cooperation? This is a model of coexistence. This is a model of political paralysis, isn't it, Minister? Yeah, yes, it is. It, it so, is. So, so what about this but, but cooperation? You, you know, you know, political paralysis. I'm not talking of cooperation. I'm talking of coexistence. Because in Lebanon, somehow, 
Muslims and uh, Christians are still living together in a power sharing model in parity where this does not exist anywhere else in the world. And Sunnis and Shias, despite all the tension around us, are still not fighting in Lebanon. And there's no leadership and there's no decisions. Yes. This is from un the central bank government. This is kind also of the parallels that we have in the whole region, because in Lebanon, it is somehow reflected in politics, this, this will of eliminating the other. But the you're other. to blame. You're part of this system. You're part of this yes, system I'm, that is, is, has broken down I'm, completely. I'm not de denying our, our global and collective responsibility. Last October, thousands of demonstrators, angry and frightened, called for an end to political corruption and for a new untainted set of politicians to run the country. They toppled two administrations in rapid succession. The protest movement cut across religious and political lines with demands for the recovery of stolen funds and for the corrupt to be held accountable. And there was plenty to account for. Years of squalor in the streets as politicians bickered over garbage collection contracts and electricity failed for hours on end, month after month. Among those being called out for criticism was the Hezbollah movement, the self-styled party of God financed by Iran. And they didn't like it. Let's talk you about the wrong, massive Duncan. street protest that we've seen in Lebanon in recent months. One moment you seem to be listening to them, then you claimed with no evidence that they were being exploited by the U.S. and Israel. And then last October you sent your thugs to beat up the demonstrators because they dared to criticize your leaders. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Tim. I don't. I don't know you like that. I mean, I don't know that. Are you sure that we send our people? Do you have a proof for what? It was say? widely you reported at the time. There. We were against them in October we, and December. I mean, widely. You know the media issue. I'm, you're in the media. I'm in the media. This is a misinformation. This yeah, we don't make it up. I can tell you. I, I live Mr. here. Mr. Musawi, we I'm don't around, make it up. I'm around. I, I live here, and I tell you. I, I tell you, we, we are not part of those who suppress the people. We are with the masses. We are with those who demonstrated. We want to protect them. We have the same issue. Actually, we consider... Mr. Musawi, in December, okay. your supporters attacked an anti-government protest camp in central Beirut, and the army had to be called in to disperse the groups. Around the same time, you and your allies from Amal targeted other anti-government protest camps in different parts of Lebanon. So much for listening to the demonstrators and heeding their demands. You beat them up. I can simply uh, say this is not true. Well, Hezbollah, whether you like it or dislike it, represents a large component of Lebanese society. It's a main political party, political actor in Lebanon, and everybody is welcome to join and help us in this, whether directly being involved directly or supportive or not supportive of the government. Let's see for the observers, internal observers and external observers like you, sir, if you succeed. You, you say this, and I hear what you say. Why should the West lift a finger to help a government that's effectively being constructed by Hezbollah, which is widely viewed around the world as a We are not instructed or constructed. What you're saying is a point of view, sir. It's not absolute reality. Hezbollah is widely seen around the world as a terrorist Hezbollah organization. It is not seen around the world. It's considered by some, but it is not what this some. I don't agree with this view. You might disagree ideologically, politically, strategically with the Lebanese political party, the Lebanese national resistance movement. That's your right to do so. But it's a major, represent a major component of the Lebanese society, social component and political component. What I'm saying, take us to test as a government. I'm telling our Western countries with, to which we are committed to develop the best out of relations, culturally, politically, socially, economically, strategically with the Western countries. We're very close to most of those countries. We have very good relations which we want to develop, to deepen, strengthen and enlarge these Western countries. Take us to test and about what we are doing, what we are planning to do, not in about what is said here or there or about any ideological sloganeering or ideological views.
According to the Drug Enforcement Agency, Hezbollah increasingly relies on criminal revenue from a wide array of sources that include the Lebanese diaspora, group members, affiliates, etc. The organization has even competed for money laundering contracts in the same manner as Colombian drug cartels and other criminal organizations. So you belong with some you pretty can, you shady can continue, groups you can on the international crime scene, don't you? You can. You can continue to mention all, if you want to continue this episode as long as you want, you can continue to mention as much as you want of examples, but this is not going to change the truth that these are things are put in the mouth of the <coughs> Western media against Hezbollah, against any uh, resistance movement, against any resistance group in order to distort its, its image, in order to justify any sanctions against it. You asked for examples, I gave you some. Let's talk, if we may, about um, your support for the Assad government, Bashar al-Assad in Syria, despite its shocking disregard for human life, especially civilians. Um, you could hardly claim <coughs> ignorance of what they've been doing. Or don't you, the party of God, have anything to say about policies of rape, torture, and extermination that Bashar al-Assad and his forces have been carrying out? You've got no principles, no red lines as far as that sort of behavior is concerned? The, let me ask you about the Western media and about your government and the Western governments and the United States governments and what they did to the Israelis who crush the people every day, who occupy Palestine, who occupy parts of Lebanon, who occupy parts of the uh, Golan Heights and who continue to occupy also they want to annex part of Jordan and parts of, uh, of other places, I mean. If you we want we, to we ask those questions way, in other programs. I'm talking to you about Hezbollah. I'm talking to you about Hezbollah because you represent Hezbollah. And I'm asking <coughs> why you We're support, fighting, no, why you support a regime okay. in Syria that We're carries out extermination policies towards its own people. We're why? supporting our cause. We're, we're fighting. Listen, we, we're, we're, we were fighting takfiri groups who, are, who beheaded people, who took the hearts of people, who crushed, the, who crushed <coughs> the, the children, who made annihilation. This is, we were fighting the takfiri groups. It is a priority because they came and they uh, carried aggressions against our part of the country. You know, we had wide operations against them in North Lebanon, in East Lebanon. Mr. Mustawi, the important is thing is that by lending Mr. Assad, your support, you became complicit in everything he did. And these are crimes against humanity. The UN are, High Commissioner and, for and, Human and Rights said Syria had become complicit, a torture chamber. And you are complicit, and you are complicit with, uh, with Mohammed bin Salman all and all the atrocities he's making in Yemen? Uh, the United States and Britain and all governments, you are complicit. So it's the West's fault, along with everyone else's. Lots of blame to be shared around. So much, in fact, that it doesn't actually stick to anyone. The parties take responsibility in name only, and they stay in their posts whatever mistakes or crimes they've committed. It's a system of accountability, but with zero consequences, except, of course, for the people who have to live with all the criminality and incompetence, poverty and now hunger. Small wonder that their patience is close to exhausted. How long do you expect the people to wait for these rights that you're promising, these reforms that you're promising, the end to corruption, and the As cry that they you, keep sir, saying, which is, struggle. give us back our looted money. Give us back our looted money. This is what they say. When are, when are the people of Lebanon going to get back I their know looted we are money? Very much, we are very much aware and committed to that. It's not that government that looted the money before. It's not this government that created the situation uh, that was before. But, however, we are committed to do all what we can with our friends, again, saying inside and outside, reaching to everybody in order to get out of this vicious, destructive circle that Lebanon found itself in. I understand the very legitimate frustration as well as the very legitimate demands of the Lebanese population, of which I'm a member. I'm a Lebanese citizen before being a Lebanese official. We understand these problems. We have to get together and try to get out of this very difficult situation. At least we have the commitment and the clarity that we need to get out of this difficult situation. So I ask, where are the reforms? Why aren't you pushing for them? You blame the system. I'm well, asking, talking about what's the, the point of having you in government talking, if you don't bring about reforms? I'm talking about the ailments. I'm talking 
I'm talking about the ailments of the system that has been on, going on for so many years, I mean, for decades. Now we have reached where we reached. We should be held responsible for what happened. Everybody is responsible. Those who were in the government, we are part of the government. We don't deny our responsibility. We have to embrace our full responsibility in this. And we're ready to take part in the respons responsibility. But still, when you talk about the kind of reforms that we want to do, they should be structured. We are one component of the mosaic of components and constituencies in the Lebanese society. We take our share and others have to take their responsibilities and they should be blamed for what they did. If even just a few of those comforting words from our politicians had been turned into action, then Lebanon might look very different from the way it does today. But no single political figure or faction appears to have the authority to bring about fundamental change. And there's little chance of the different groups agreeing on a single course of action. As for the people, many say they'd leave if they could. Food prices have skyrocketed, unemployment is rife, the banks have severely limited access to savings. For now, two important questions hang unanswered over Lebanon. Can the cash-strapped West afford to give it the emergency support it needs? And in a highly volatile region like this, with conflict never far from the surface, can it really afford not to?